it's almost about that time. Right about now. Right about now. Funk, funk, funk. Funk, so brother. Brother, brother, brother. Alexander Stilla, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. Thanks for having me. Really a pleasure to have you. Before we launch into this incredible book you've written and this story that you've exposed uh, right under our noses in the Upper West Side, who knew this was happening? Um, I'd love to get a little bit of your writing origin story because you have such an interesting uh, backstory here, uh, how you got into writing. Can you can you give the listeners a little, a little sure. brief it's version? A, of it? Yeah, it, it is a long one because I've been doing this for um, decades now, but I... My father was a journalist, an Italian journalist, and um, I originally wanted to write fiction as it happened. And then by the time I was 21, I had used up all the um, limited life experience that I had and decided that I was kind of washed up and um, wasn't sure what to do, worked in publishing for a little while. And I moved to Italy um, working for a publishing house. And... Um, um, Italy at the time was undergoing a period of intense political violence. There was left-wing terrorism, right-wing bombings, the mm. mafia, mafia war in Sicily, all kinds of stuff going on. And it became very interesting to me to sort of figure out, like, what's going on in this place? And um, um, why is it this country, if you just read the news, you'd think that this place was about to fall apart. But I was living in Milan, which was a very rich and stable society, and I thought, how do I make sense of these two conflicting realities, the underlying wealth and stability of this society and this uh, political violence going on? And I thought that was really an interesting thing to write about. And I found that certain novelists did a much better job of writing about it than journalists did. And mm -hmm. so I was reading a certain amount of really interesting narrative nonfiction, you know, Norman Mailer's Executioner Song, some of... Right. Um, 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 there's a famous Sicilian novelist, Leonardo Shasha, who also wrote nonfiction. Um, and V.S. Naipaul had written some very good things before he became kind of old and cranky. He wrote a lot of good <laughs> reportage. Um, right. And so I thought, wow, this is the kind of work I'd really like to do. And um, so that kind of got me into it. And then uh, I decided to go back to the States and try and learn my craft and became a journalist. Um, and, um, but I always had the idea of returning to Italy and doing some of that stuff. And then, um, I was uh, working actually as a legal journalist, um, because that's what I could find work doing and, uh, but doing a lot of longer pieces. And then I eventually felt like I was confident enough in the craft part of things to undertake a project that was meaningful to me and that was longer. And so I... I found a book project that would get me back to Italy, which was uh, uh, a book about five Italian Jewish families during the fascist period. My father um, had been a Jewish refugee, Russian Jewish refugee in Italy, who then had to leave the country. So that was um, something that was meaningful to me. And I began kind of getting interested in that story and realized there wasn't really good uh, a good book of the type that I wanted to write or wanted to read on that and I thought this could be a project that would work for me that I might be able to do well. So I uh, I started working on that and that became my first book, Benevolence and Betrayal. Um, and then once I did that, I thought, wow, I really like this book writing thing and yeah. I'm not sure I want to go back to doing, you know, um, periodic journalism. And so I, uh, I figured out a way to, uh, at the time, it was a bit easier to make a living as a freelancer. And um, so I did that for many years and then um, went back and wrote a book that in a way got into this problem of political violence and organized crime, which was my second book, um, Excellent Cadavers, which, which was very much in a way set in the period that I'd lived in Italy in the, uh, in the 1980s and early 90s of trying to understand what the relationship, you know, how political violence was used as a tool to maintain order um, in mm. Italy and the way in which it was sometimes uh, manipulated by um, uh, the parties in power, uh, the, you know, the kind of relationship of collusion. 
between the Christian Democratic Party, which was the principal party of government in Italy and um, organized crime in southern Italy, where a lot of that was tolerated, um, but helped, helped to maintain a system of power in Italy. Mm. So that um, that became my second book. And and um, so no. I, I don't want to bore you with a long recitation no, no, of all the different and projects. We, that, we'll take it to the present. You, you are currently a, a, a professor or um, tell me what you're doing yeah. currently. Yeah, so um, I freelanced for like 18 years um, and uh, did a lot of magazine work. Um, my, I, 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 did a, I also had a, a period when I was a contract writer for the New York Times doing um, certain kinds of pieces. Um, and um, um, so then in 2004, I actually started teaching a little bit and found that I really liked it. And thought, gee, um, this would be fun to do. It would be a nice balance to the, the slightly lonely freelance life um, mm-hmm. and all the pressures of um, having to make all of your money from writing. So then by chance, yeah. Columbia happened to come along in 2004. Uh, Nicholas Lemon had taken over as dean of the journalism school and had a position that seemed very, very well suited to me and asked me to apply for it. And so that just happened. It really kind of uh, fell into my lap. And uh, that's been a very um, uh, happy relationship. Um, so I, you know, fortunately, it's um, given me enough time to still do most of the work that I care yeah. about and, and save me from the pressure of having to, you know, when you're a freelancer, I mean, for about 18 years, I was like a one person factory. I was just yeah. cranking out work at a at a real clip and you had to have many projects working at the same time. And, you know, yeah. um, it was great. It was very productive, but also kind of exhausting. And you were never, um, uh, you could never really relax because you had to always have yeah. stuff. Always never know your next shot. I've been a freelancer. You never know when you're, are they going to pay you this month? And then they don't, you yeah. have to chase after. Yeah. Pay. And then yeah. a story that has to be rewritten and you don't get paid and, yeah. you know, it's just stuff happens. So, uh, so ending up with this nice teaching position was, was good. Yeah. And, um, and also I had, um, I had really seriously contemplated an academic career after finishing, you know, my first book was really in a sense a work of history. And so I applied to history graduate schools and was accepted um, and uh, accepted uh, an offer from Princeton. But then I deferred because I was living in Italy and I started working on my second book and I thought, They've given me a nice advance to write this book. Do I want to do this book about the mafia or do I, do I want to write a dissertation? And I decided I'd take the book. So, mm. um, but so coming back to academe was actually a kind of welcome um, return to something that had attracted me. I like, um, you know, I like the life of, um, you know, being in touch with research and reading and walking out. So um, I've really liked that a lot. And um, yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I and it comes across your 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 extensive background as a as a reporter and a uh, in this in this newest book of yours um, about the Sullivanians. Is this is the philosophy called Sullivanism? Sullivanianism? Like what did they? How did they position? Well, it? they. Um, I don't know what they would have called it. They 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 wrote a theoretical book called The Conditions of Human Growth, which they took very seriously. Um, and which makes for somewhat strange reading now. It's very, uh, it's quite dense and turgid, and it lays out a theory of, of human growth, which they thought was, um, was quite scientifically grounded, but actually has no empirical evidence to support it. But um, what they took, um, Jane Pierce, who was really the, the kind of theoretical brains, of the operation uh, was a woman who had a medical degree from the University of Chicago and had studied at the William Allenson White Institute in New York, which is to this day a very prestigious um, neo-Freudian institute that was founded uh, by Harry Stock, Stack Sullivan, among others, who was um, one of the kind of founders of what's sort of known as interpersonal um, psychology. The idea that you know Freud was all focused on first few years of your life and the Oedipus complex and the inner conflicts between the id and the ego and um, um, the very early life of people. And Sullivan insisted that um, there were phases of life that um, 
were very important, that people continued to grow into adulthood, that you needed to look at society that people grew up in and the various relationships in their life, including in the present. And um, that people could, in fact, recoup phases of development that they had missed out on earlier in life. Um, one of those phases, you know, things like parallel play when you're a small child and you um, interact with a, another toddler or a, a phase that he referred to as chumship, which is this period um, when people are like, you know, nine to 12 before they become fully adolescent, they form very strong attachments to um, peers of the same sex they get very close to and have very close relationships. And people often miss out on that, Sullivan believes. Sullivan had a rather lonely childhood and was an only child. And so he didn't have, excuse Whoa. me, that's uh, New York for you. Um, what was that sound? Uh, it's a, I think it was just a, a siren. Uh, I live fairly near a hospital and um, okay. a truck I going over something. Week. Yeah. Okay, but, good. No, <laughs> okay. No, one, no one was hurt as far as I know. I have I'm um, having so, a so PTSD Sullivan believed, from nine. Yeah. So Sullivan believed in these phases and the possibility of continued growth into adulthood through exposure to different kinds of people. And he worked with he did quite innovative work with schizophrenic patients who he had living together communally and who did quite well under those in that setting. And so Jane Pierce and her um, husband, Saul Newton, who worked at the White Institute, but um, didn't have training as a psychotherapist, he'd work in the bursar's office, said, okay, let's apply this idea to everyone. What if lots of us had the opportunity to live communally? What, you know, if, if people really need exposure to multiple people during their life, then the family is by definition limiting and suffocating monogamy and monogamous marriage is limiting and suffocating. So we need to get people to branch out. We need to get them to explore. This is how they're really gonna come into their own. On top of it, they were uh, Marxists and believed that the nuclear family was sort of the pillar of capitalist reproduction. Um, and so the family was the society's agent to turn you know, little children into good productive citizens who would do what their parents did and keep the system going. <clears throat> and so they felt we need to break that. If we're going to have a new kind of society, we need to have a new kind of person, a person who has um, been encouraged to grow and to explore and to leave the comfort of the family. Um, so they began advising their parent, their patients to, um, uh, you know, have lots of sex with lots of people, preferably not too much with their spouse, to then live with each other in large group apartments, a sort of replicating what Sullivan was doing with the patients with schizophrenia. Um, and this then, by that point, we're in the 1960s, and it kind of fit with the whole sort of ethos of the age of Aquarius and um, communal living, and there were thousands of communes sprouting up uh, around the country. The Black Panthers were um, creating a kind of model of community that they found interesting. Um, and there were, you know, a whole kind of counterculture growing up of people who had been protesting the Vietnam War, who were criticizing capitalism, who wanted, um, you know, uh, a life of greater authenticity, sexual exploration, and so forth. And so they were quite successful in bringing people into this right. community. And, um, uh, it so, it sort of fit the the culture of the time. Yeah, I mean, point. a lot of times with the success of of cults like this is that they that they have good timing and they tap into a kind of a um, the the beliefs of the time. And this is a a time. This is a time where a lot of people were breaking with traditions, uh, traditional models, right? Like the traditional nuclear family and uh, traditional government structures, et cetera. So this is the '60s, um, and it's also a time of talk about where we are sort of with the sexual revolution, because this whole idea of polygamy and, and stuff kind of fits during this era, because this is sort of the era also of free love. And right when the, you know, when the pills comes into play and this is before AIDS, yeah. right. That, that was yeah. also. Yeah. I think that uh, for me, one of the things that when I, when I looked at the, uh, you know, particularly the dates, the Sullivan Institute is formally, 
um, begun in 1957, which is the date that um, the pill is actually submitted to the Federal Drug Administration for authorization. It then gets authorized in 1960. So there's already this, um, we're on the cusp of a revolution um, and you have a kind of growing dissatisfaction with um, the, the kind of Ozzie and Harriet, a father knows best kind of 1950s life. Um, you have, um, you know, things like um, Betty Friedan's um, feminine mystique and the unhappiness of um, uh, traditional housewives who suddenly feel their lives are empty and hold nothing for them because they have no active role. Um, and so those are kind of preconditions and the pill um, seems like a total game changer to everyone, which in many ways it was. And what it did was it allowed um, it, it allowed you to separate sex from childbearing. It allowed you to have sex without guilt. It allowed you to have sex without worrying about who the father of the child might be because you were protected. And so I think they felt that um, we've been doing things for centuries in a certain way because of um, the problem of, um, you know, uncertain paternity, property rights, uh, the father's position being threatened by the possibility that somebody else's sperm might be, um, you know, have, you know, impregnated their wife. And mm. suddenly you say, let's, we can now completely rewrite the rules. These rules about monogamy and possessiveness and nuclear family were all organized around this idea that no longer has any reason to be. What if we were completely free to reorganize the rules of life in a way that actually just made us happy, that fit with our, what our desires were? You know, let's be honest. People want to sleep with multiple people. Uh, they, they say, I'll love you forever. But of course, they have attractions to other people. Um, why not live uh, following your desires and allowing yourself to be as fulfilled as you can? What if you could throw off the ethos of possessiveness and uh, jealousy? And um, if your wife was doing that while you were doing that, you, mo you both might be much less, uh, you must, but might, that might be uh, much happier and you wouldn't resent your spouse because um, she was limiting you or he was limiting you. Um, and that was, the, that was kind of the idea. And so in a sense, this makes a lot of sense for this period of time between the introduction of the pill and the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, in which all of a sudden then sex becomes much more complicated and the idea mm -hmm. that you can have free sex without consequences is suddenly doesn't look so possible any longer. Yeah. And so there's this kind of 25 year window in which um, anything goes and you can rewrite the rules. And that's what effectively this group was trying to do. So let's talk about how it works. So they start, you mentioned the, the founders, Saul Newton and Linda Pierce start what's called the Sullivan Institute, right? Yeah. Which is in, in uh, up the upper West side of Manhattan. Right. And, some of their, and it's not like a tradition. It starts off more of like as a kind of psychotherapy group, right? Where there's different patients that come in and, and, right. and have sessions with these different, um, these different, uh, therapists, um, who, and, and some of the early followers are pretty well-known people. I mean, Jackson Pollock yep. was an early, and I say follower, mm -hmm. I guess, patients. Yeah, he was a patient the, the and, and, um, he was brought into it by Clement Greenberg, who was the most kind of influential um, art critic of the late 1940s and 1950s, and was one of Pollock's big champions. And uh, Clement Greenberg bought, brought dozens of artists into therapy. It was sort of seen, um, you know, Greenberg was very influential and the artists wanted to please him because he'd made and broke reputations. And so if he said you needed therapy and you're sort of becoming, uh, you know, a complete person was dependent on getting into therapy, you got into therapy. So you had all these artists uh, getting into therapy, Kenneth Nolan, the very well-known abstract expressionist, Jules Alitsky, um, and lots of others, uh, Larry Poons, the dancer Lucinda Childs, uh, the singer Judy, Judy Collins, Collins. Yeah. yeah, was in therapy. 
And so you had these really smart, interesting people, and they, of course, were already interested in counterculture. So the idea that um, we don't have to follow the same dull rules that everybody else has been following, and we want to live in a more authentic way, and we want our lives to be centered around our own creativity um, rather than on fitting into uh, society's traditional mold of what an adult is supposed to be. And so part of that involves sending your kids away to boarding school so that um, uh, Jules Zalitsky, the painter, um, uh, gets into therapy and very quickly they advise him to send his young daughter away to boarding school. So instead of changing diapers and reading bedtime stories and sleeping with the same woman, he's having lots of affairs and focusing on his work and having a great time. And for a while that, you know, is an appealing thing. So it fit into a certain, uh, you know, cultural milieu. And that, of course, then gave a lot of prestige to younger people getting into therapy, like, wow, there are all these smart, creative people um, doing this mm -hmm. therapy, they must know something. And uh, I'll get into it, too. Um, and they had a very, um, in some ways, quite exciting life that um, this community generated. Um, they would have parties on Friday and Saturday evening. And Lots of people got into it, even before, rather than starting with therapy, they might simply be invited to a party with a friend of theirs. And here are all these people, young, cool, hip, smart, you know, people living in New York. And um, guess what? At the end of the, you know, you could be a, a shy, you know, introverted guy. And some woman would come up to you and say, do you have a date tonight? And uh, that meant, are you going to go home with me? And so... Um, um, you know, yes, yeah. it sounds kind of that, fun. That I mean, you get, to, you get to have a sex with as many people as you want. You get to have the validation of a, of a train, a quote unquote trained therapist. You, you, you know, you don't feel guilty for sending your kids to boarding school because that that's, you know, what's helping you grow as a person. I mean, it, right. it all sounds utopian and wonderful. And yet, and it also sounds like, Oh, this is just a, like a sixties hippy dippy free love thing. And yet, it gets it. It's not. It's more than that, right? It's, yeah. Um, well, I, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. the thing is that you what what people didn't quite understand initially is that they were giving a lot of power to these shrinks, and mm -hmm. that the therapists were controlling their lives to uh, a really unhealthy degree. And so, uh, you know, so it's all fine and well to say. Um, um, you need to date multiple people and put yourself out there and make yourself available to people. But then it also came with a, a series of kind of very strong do's and don'ts. Like there's something wrong with you if you wanted to be alone on a given evening and uh, read a book. Um, you should be with somebody else. Even if you're not having sex, you should be sleeping with um, one of your same sex friends and bonding with them. Um, so there was a kind of compulsion to the whole thing. And then let's say you were really into one of the people you were dating and you wanted to see that person often. Suddenly your shrink is saying, hey, wait a second. No, you're getting into what they call the focus. And so you've got to stop seeing that person so much. You've got to see other people. Uh, they would often break up relationships uh, if they were getting too close. And so uh, you realize that um, you were actually giving up certain, instead of it being a freeing thing, you were giving up freedom as well. And then, you know, since you mentioned the kids, you know, these kids who were sent away to boarding school in some cases had, you know, really, really bad experiences. You know, people were sent away at age five, age seven, even age three mm. in one case. And, you know, the places in this country that would accept a child of five are not a place you would want to have a kid. And some of these places. Yeah. Um, you tell one story, I think, of a, of a boy who is looking, doesn't want to go to boarding school and is looking at boarding schools. And then, you know, he, he's talking to the headmaster and all of a sudden the parents he, are just leave him there, right? Yeah. They just drop him off there. Then you give yeah. him a warning. And he says, excuse me, I have to leave. And the, the principal of the school said, no, you're not leaving. And his parents don't even turn around to say goodbye to him. He said, they duped me and they didn't have the guts to say goodbye. And that kid, you know, hmm. went to, you know, boarding school after boarding school, didn't read, learn to read until he was 11 because these were all sort of completely disorganized, uh, very sort of loosey-goosey uh, progressive schools where you, you didn't- yeah, It sounds like any, so. one of the boarding schools was in Arizona and it sounded really shady. Right? Yeah, that was really, really bad. That place was closed down because of systematic brutality that the um, director 
uh, you know, uh, use against uh, kids there. And, um, you know, that was really, um, you know, that was really, really bad. And so these kids, I mean, in a sense, what this group was doing was offering people a kind of extended adolescence. And so that's great for a while. You know, let's say you were too shy and uptight in college to, you know, ask out the person you had a crush on and uh, live your life as freely as you wanted. Now you were in this situation where it was going to happen. And the price of that was the kids all had to disappear because there's no room for little children in a college dorm. And um, mm. so, um, and, and the parents themselves. So it's not again. It's not just therapy and sending your kids that. That's already pretty bad. But the parents themselves, like the group, then starts only interacting with the group. They start living in the in sort of single sex living situations, right? Like it becomes right. more of a commune situation, but in the middle of Manhattan. Yes, and then and then it becomes step by step more insular. Um, the need on the part of the therapist to control the people in the group uh, increases so that um, one of the things that happens in the early years between, let's say, the mid and late 60s and the mid 70s is it was a place with a lot of spontaneity and creativity. You had, uh, you know, Lucinda Childs giving a dance class and um, the painter Al Loving giving painting classes and uh, people doing pottery and having rock bands and a comedy group and Richard Price writing sketches for, um, you know, a comedy night. And all that sounds great. Um, and then at a certain point when the theater group becomes really popular, the leadership thinks we now have, we got to take this over. So the theater group mm -hmm. is becoming too popular. And so this is, becomes a vehicle for control. So this thing happens in 1977 when the leadership essentially takes over the theater group and everybody in the group has to become part of what they call the fourth wall repertory company, um, this theater company that they, um, they found and they buy a theater on the Lower East Side. And so what had been a kind of bottom up kind of fermenting of creativity becomes a top-down leadership-driven thing in which the leadership is deciding, you know, what plays we're going to put on and who's going to do what. <clears throat> and a lot of the spontaneity and creativity goes out of it. Um, so there's that step, which is very important. And then in 1979, um, there's an accident at the nuclear plant um, near, known as Three Mile Island, near Harrisburg, yeah, uh, well, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Three Mile Island. And... The, um, the leadership freaks out and they're convinced that the government is lying about the amount of radiation coming out of the plant, that New York is in danger, they need to leave. Um, several of the, of the senior women in the group are pregnant at the time. So they, they decide to decamp, evacuate New York and go down to Orlando, Florida. And the entire like 250 people go down to Orlando and spend 10 days in a motel getting drunk and having sex in Howard mm. Johnson's expecting that the world is ending, except then the world doesn't end. New York doesn't end up dying of, you know, nuclear contamination. But this becomes a kind of moment in which the paranoia and the fear of the outside world becomes sort of systematized into the group's life. So they then set up, um, you can no longer eat food that's been grown in the Northeast. And so they set up their own food co-op, you have to buy your food at the food co-op and um, you, um, uh, um, they have, everybody has to listen to, they, they're they listening 24 hours a day to two radio stations so they can pick up on some other nuclear accident that might be happening somewhere that you don't know about. And uh, they set up a guard system at the headquarters of the group. Mm. And, a security squad, everything is getting, you know, slightly militarized after Three Mile Island. And then the AIDS epidemic hits in the early 80s, and that becomes a reason or an excuse to separate people even more drastically from the outside world. You can't eat in a restaurant in New York because all the waiters are gay and you're going to get AIDS from them. Um, oh and so you have to go 100 miles from New York to eat in a restaurant. You know, crazy stuff. And um, 
you can then only have sex with people in the group um, and uh, so on and so forth. So these become ways of further separating um, people in the group um, you know, from the outside world. Kids who are in boarding school are told they're not allowed to come back to New York, which of course is ridiculous um, because they're not, you know, unless they're doing something particularly risky, any more at risk of getting AIDS in New York than anywhere else. But these become ways of, of isolating people and keeping them in the kind of um, grasp of the leadership. So people start, you know, once the control, you know, people start defecting, some people start leaving. Um, but, and this reminds me of like what you hear about a lot with Scientology, when they leave, they're harassed, they're often harassed or um, made to feel, you know, they've certainly alienated from the rest of the people in the group and then often harassed. You tell the story of one former kind of high level Sullivanian who um, was like, talk about that, that he goes to the subway station and was like dangled over the tracks. I mean, what, yeah. what, what happened? To that yeah. So what happened one? is um, the, the guy who left was a, uh, a prominent therapist in the group who had been trained by them. Um, and he decides he's had enough. Um, he doesn't like what he's doing as a therapist uh, and feels he's doing things that are really unethical and destructive of his patients' um, lives. And moreover, he wants to marry and have, make a family with a woman that he's dating and he's tired of having his relationships broken up. So they decide to leave the two of them. And moreover, they help a couple of other people who want to get out um, to leave because some of the people in the group have been out of touch with anyone else in their life for like 15 years. And so the idea of leaving mm -hmm. is almost impossible for them to conceive. Um, yeah. But so he's then seen as a kind of subversive element who is undermining the group and um, uh, two members of the group uh, ambush him in the Union Square subway station uh, in New York City and dangle him. They're wearing like ski masks or something, but he knows who they are. He recognizes the people that he, you know, one of them was like a former roommate of his. Uh, and they dangle him over the side of the tracks and say, next time we're going to throw you in front of the train if you mm -hmm. keep this up, uh, which fortunately they didn't do. But they also beat up uh, another defector who... Um, was a good friend of this uh, this person, and um, and there's kind of increasing um, uh, spiral of violence. They do something really crazy where they basically vandalize um, the house that's next door to the building that they own on 100th Street and Broadway um, because these these young kids who live in this building were disrespectful to them, and so they hmm. basically just trash the place. And they could have easily. Um, you know, hurt someone or been arrested or had uh, police come along in the middle of this, you know, sort of punitive raid. So there was a kind of increasing sort of um, craziness to things in the late 80s. And uh, one of the things that then um, happens that really breaks the group open is uh, a woman who had been in the group for a very long time, uh, like 17 years, at age 41, has a child with another with a, a guy in the group and after the child is like a few months old she's told to stop baby uh, breastfeeding and then she's told that she's not allowed to see her daughter and the daughter has hmm. been assigned to like a babysitter and is living sort of at least nominally in the father's apartment and the mother is denied all access to her child and the mother as you can imagine is incredibly distraught incredibly upset, gets more and more desperate, and finally uh, goes to see a lawyer and uh, at the urging of one of the defectors who's already left. And the lawyer says, you need to kidnap, kidnap your own child. You as the mother have a right to your child. So if you take the child, it's not kidnapping. It's just your right. And so she hires yeah. two bodyguards and they wait for the, the babysitter to come out in the morning with a stroller to take the child for a walk. And the bodyguards immobilize the babysitter and the mother takes the child and they, she goes off into hiding. And that then provokes a, a custody battle with the father. And then the group, be, the whole thing becomes kind of um, uh, finally brought out to the open. The mother then gives a series of interviews to the Village Voice and other media. And uh, they're, you know, 
a, a bunch of lawsuits that end up um, dividing and weakening the group to a great degree. It's kind of the beginning of the end. Yeah, that. So what the great unraveling sort of happens with? I mean, it's sort of a series of little things, right? But that was the the ma one of the major events. And then this article that you said that you mentioned these are series of articles that come out in the Voice really depict um, the Sullivan the Sullivanians as you know like a bizarre love cult. I think they're called. Yeah. And, you know, they talk mm -hmm. about their psycho uh, the psychotic or psychotherapist. And, and they call out this Saul Newton. We haven't talked a lot about him, but he's sort of like, there's a, there's a few people at the top, but he's really one of the sort of most seems like out there and authoritarian, right? And he was, I mean, I think he tells stories that he would just require sometimes his patients just to give him oral sex in the middle of a, of a, of a session, right? Talk, talk yep. to us a little bit about Saul Newton. Well, so he, he was a guy who um, was, he was born in 1906 in New Brunswick, Canada, um, moved to the U.S., um, went to the University of Wisconsin, then became a labor organizer and a communist in Chicago in the 1930s. Um, he then went and fought in the Lincoln Brigade in Spain as part of the anti-fascist resistance to um, Franco, which gave him a lot of sort of credibility in left-wing circles. He then came back um, and right after World War, he then fought in World War II over in Europe. And after World War II, he starts to work at the White Institute in New York, which is this psychoanalytic institute that Harry Stack Sullivan and others founded, mm -hmm. where he's really exposed to the ideas of Sullivan and psychoanalysis. And that's where he meets this woman, Jane Pierce, who is already a trained psychotherapist working there. And um, he's been married three times already. He dumps wife number three and marries Jane, who becomes wife number four. And Jane, Jane's credentials as an MD and a, a trained psychotherapist create the possibility for him actually becoming a psychotherapist. One of the kind of dirty secrets of psychoanalysis is that anybody can be a psychotherapist if you or I are prepared to pay them to listen to us. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so you don't, you, you know, you need a license. You don't have to you don't have to have a degree. You need, if you want to, if I want to get reimbursed by my insurance company, you have to, the therapists have to have a license. But if you don't care about getting reimbursed by insurance, anybody is free to call themselves a psychotherapist. So, so he becomes the director of this new thing called the Sullivan Institute. But Jane has the kind of credibility to give it um, a kind of air right. of seriousness and a number of interesting, innovative, young psychotherapists follow her from the White Institute and go to do training at this new institute. And so the initial two quickly become six, become 10, become 12. Um, and by then you're, you're up to seeing hundreds of patients because if each person sees 20 patients, let's say, um, you know, you, um, you, you start to have a certain amount of critical mass. Uh, so Newton, even though he's uncredentialed, is the director of the Institute, which gives him power over the assigning of patients. And then they came up with a rather brilliant idea, which really magnified his power. In 1971, they decided to create a training program, which could be mm -hmm. used for, instead of the, the people who'd been brought in as therapists before that, often had uh, medical degrees or had PhDs in psychology that they'd gotten somewhere else. And then they would sort of go to the Sullivan Institute to practice. They thought, what if we trained our own people? They don't even necessarily have to have finished college. In fact, better if they haven't, because they, they won't, they won't have, won't have learned the wrong things. They won't have read a lot of Freud and read a lot of, um, you know, um, this or that, um, you know, psychoanalysts will be able to form them in the way that we think we should. So you have these people who are, you know, 20, 25 years old with no experience, who are taught mm -hmm. to do things in a certain way. And Newton controls their life. He controls their ability to earn a living because so they're living in a Sullivanian apartment. Their, their community and their friendship is composed entirely of Sullivanians. Their ability to make money and earn a living is dependent on Saul, um, you know, um, funneling patients to them. And um, so 
he also uses a lot of the people in this training program are young 20 something women, some of them quite attractive. And so, you know, he demands um, that they go on dates with him, which means have sex. Um, he would demand people, uh, in some cases, patients to give him oral sex during sessions and then pay him for their troubles. Um, <laughs> he would uh, do the same with uh, young therapists um, that were in supervision with him because, you know, there was also a kind of um, financial dimension to all this, which is everybody in the group is in therapy and there, that means generally being in therapy at least two or three times a week, which means that a substantial amount of your income is going the rents are cheap on the Upper West Side, but a lot of your money is going into the therapy. And so you're an ordinary person. You're paying your therapist. Your, para, your therapist, in turn, is in supervision with one of the top leaders like Saul Newton. And so the money then goes up the ladder to um, yeah. to Newton and the others. Um, what, so what, what ultimately – so what ultimately happens to the Sullivan Institute? Well, so um, – by the late 80s, as I mentioned, there are these lawsuits going on that are draining. They're having to pay for lawyers, and um, all of that is quite costly. They're suffering defections. There are fewer people living in the building that they bought on 100th Street. There's a mortgage to be paid. Um, they decide maybe we should sell off. They, they owned three, actually four significant pieces of property a big hotel in the Catskills, which they use as a kind of summer retreat, a theater on the Lower East Side, um, a big town, a big building on uh, West 91st Street, which was their headquarters and the, and the residence of the leadership mm. and a building on 100th Street and Broadway. And so, uh, and meanwhile, Saul Newton by the late 80s is becoming um, senile and his power mm -hmm. is waning uh, and um, when he then is no longer able to control the group, he's put into, uh, first they move him out into an apartment and then into uh, a hospital. And it leaves two of his wives, his, his sixth wife and his fifth wife, who are both therapists in the group, who begin fighting with each other, their lawsuits, they sell property. The whole thing falls apart. They can't sustain the group. And by 1991, it effectively dissolves because they've sold off the theater and um, uh, the property in the Catskills and everybody kind of scatters. Um, so although interestingly, um, some of the people remain in Sullivanian apartments to this day, in fact, and, and are still very loyal to the ideas behind it, even though they're not in an organized group and others, um, you know, break with the group and they suddenly get back in touch with um, relatives they haven't spoken to in 15 years. And in some cases, they discover their parents are dead. In other cases, they reconnect with um, relatives they haven't seen and are welcomed back by them. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, they sort of, it's, it's almost like for some of these people, uh, like Rip Van Winkle, where um, they felt they'd mm. been asleep for 20 years and suddenly they, they go out into the wider world and discover it's a whole new, you know, on the world. Help people listening understand how, you know, so many of the people that were members of this group, like you said, are artists and intellectuals and New York City, you know, New York Manhattanites and, you know, sophisticated. And I think a lot of times our impression is that people who join cults are dumb or ignorant or, um, you know, fanatics. Um, but that's not the case. Yeah. And, and honestly, in my, in my, uh, ex own experience in talking to people, other people of cults, oftentimes a lot of people who are in cults are at very well educated. So I think it's yeah. very hard for people to understand how, how you could be so tricked if you, yeah. if you knew so much, how you could, what was your, what, what is well, your impression? I think one that? of the things is that generally people have found that people get into cults in their early twenties and mm -hmm. which is the case of most of the people in this group. And so this is a moment in which you have detached yourself from your family. You no longer have the support of your family and you're looking to be more independent. You don't want to be dependent on your family. So let's say, you know, you grew up in Kansas, you've moved to New York, you're doing a graduate program, you're lonely, you don't know people, um, you're feeling kind of vulnerable, you realized that you never dealt with 
a lot of the stuff of your past and maybe you need therapy. You're in New York and lots of people are doing therapy. You're looking for a roommate and you see a, a roommate wanted ad and you move into an apartment and there are these uh, smart young people that offer you community and they're in therapy. And so they say, I think you need to see somebody. And um, so a young person, you know, almost by definition, when you go into therapy, you're in a moment of crisis or distress. Otherwise, why are you in therapy? And so right. you go into therapy and you start talking about your problems to um, a sympathetic adult. And as you're speaking and getting it off your chest, you start to feel better. And you attribute the fact that you are feeling better to the brilliance of this person sitting across the table from you. This person has actually mm -hmm. relieved my suffering. They're really special. They're amazing. And that's called transference. It's a process that Freud identified early on as he was dealing with patients in psychoanalysis, where they would attribute, you know, sort of magical powers of healing to the psychotherapist because it's a special relationship. You're, you know, yeah. you may be telling that person secrets that you've not told your closest friends and you feel a bond and your parents weren't so great, but here's this adult who's like the great parent that you never had, the father or mother that you wish you'd always had. And that's a very powerful relationship. And uh, well-trained psychotherapists are taught to short circuit that process of idealization um, mm -hmm. so that the therapist is able to tell the patient, look, I'm not a god, I don't walk on water. Um, you're experiencing this because of the nature of this relationship. And so it's not me, it's what's going on here that you're feeling. But the Sullivanian therapist said, yes, you're right. I'm really brilliant and you can't live without me. And if you were to be without this therapy, you'd probably go crazy, commit suicide, be on drugs, become a prostitute or, you know, commit suicide. And that's what they told you think people. people that? Do you think they believe that or was it all about or was it all about power? I think a lot of it was about power. I mean, I had <clears throat> one of my interview subjects was uh, was trained as a therapist, and she said, I was told to tell people that, but I didn't really believe it. And so mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I had to say that. Um, and then one of my patients kind of laughed at me because I really I didn't say it very convincingly. So I think there yeah. were people that believed it and people who understood it was kind of a, a line. Um, but I think that there is, unfortunately, the process of transference does work both ways. It really feeds a narcissistic desire for adulation. And so I think mm -hmm. you do come to believe, wow, I really am amazing. I really am a, a healer and my patients really do need me. Um, so I think some of them did believe it. And then that, of course, makes them much more convincing in uh, feeding that line to their patients. Um, there's, so there's also that, yeah, there's also that power of groupthink where yeah, it just becomes more, talk a little bit about that. It just becomes, it's amplified by the group when, when a lot of people in a very kind of um, sequestered uh, environment all believe a certain thing, it gets reinforced. Um, even if you right. stop, even if you begin doubting it, it's so yeah. reinforced by the group, it's hard to doubt. Yeah, no, I think that. that's really important because what in a way was kind of amazing, at least from the point of view of social control is that so you were in therapy and you were getting um, the word from your therapist that your parents were terrible people, that you needed to have nothing to do with them. But you're also having weekly house meetings with the people living in your apartment and they're telling you the same things. They're telling stories of how terrible their parents were. Everybody is supposed to tell stories about their lives in these meetings. And if you were to say, hey, you know, actually, my parents weren't that bad. And my mom, you know, she could be a little overbearing, but I know she really loves me. They would say, you're, you know, you're kidding yourself. You're whitewashing things. Look about, about the time she did X. Don't you see she's really, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you think she was trying to help you, but she was really trying to smother you. You think that's love. That's not love. That's hate. Yeah. And so, right. um, so that what the therapist is telling you and the people that are telling you are not, you know, they don't have no um, financial interest in doing it. They're your friends. They're your roommates. They're the people you hang out with and, um, uh, you know, play music with and uh, sleep with. Um, 
And so they're all telling you the same thing and you come to believe it. Because, so what was kind of brilliant is if, you, if it was only the therapists that were telling you this thing, but it's everybody that you know that is telling you. So that, for example, in one of the more tragic cases um, that I wrote about where a, a woman who, um, whose husband had died uh, as a pilot in the Vietnam War, so she has two small kids and loses her husband gets into therapy, and almost the first thing the therapist does is say, you've got to send your two little girls away to boarding school. So imagine these poor young children who've lost one parent now lose the other effectively. And then bit by bit, mm -hmm. the therapist is telling her, don't go see your kids, have as little contact with them as possible. You're bad for them. You're toxic. Mm -hmm. your, your parents, you know, like this woman, as it happens, her parents ran a funeral home. So the therapist could say, don't you understand? Your family is literally death. That's what your family is. And you think you yeah. came out of that without absorbing that? You're death too to your kids. You need to stay the fuck away from them. And so then your mm. roommates are telling you the same thing. You're having doubts. And you're saying, I feel so bad because my child is really lonely and miserable at boarding school and wants me to go see her. And they say, bad idea, Jody. You need to stay tough. You need, you know, you're bad for them. And so you start to believe it um, because these are your friends that are telling you yeah. that. It's not just your therapist. And then also you become friends with all these people in the group. And then for so many years, these are, this is your friend circle. So leaving yeah. is not only your, are you leaving the uh, cult and your belief system that you hold so dear, but also if you decide that, you know, you, now you're leaving your friends behind. So I think there's a, you, you talk about the split consciousness. Yeah. Talk about that, what that is. Well, I think that what happens in, uh, for many people in groups of this kind is that um, you, um, you know, you're on the one hand, you start out and you're buying into most of what the group is offering. But then there are things that don't sit right with you. Um, you know, your therapist behaves in a way that seems really unorthodox and uh, unprofessional. Um, you're forced to do something that you don't like. Um, you're forced to sleep with somebody you don't like. Um, and you're registering these negative experiences that are making you question your belief in the wisdom of the group. And so you have to do something with that. And, you know, when you have that kind of conflicted feeling, you know, it's, it's known in psychology as cognitive dissonance, where you're having to filter out negative information that, um, uh, that doesn't, um, jibe with the life that you're leading. You know, one good example of it um, that I give is when there, this whole Three Mile Island thing happens. One of the people I interviewed was a, a medical doctor, a very smart guy. And he said, like, I knew the stuff they were telling us about radiation and New York was total bullshit. Um, but I had to go along with it. And so that was a place where I began to have a second consciousness in my mind where I was putting these things that didn't make sense to me that I knew were crap. Um, but I continued living the life, you know, he stays in the group for another seven years after that, even though he's filing away things like the things, some of the things they're saying about AIDS don't make sense. Um, you know, I know I can't get AIDS from gay waiters, um, but I'm not eating in restaurants. Mm -hmm. So whenever that happens, your the cognitive dissonance is increasing where there are more and more things that don't fit you know, I'm leading this one life and to lead this life, I have to believe that these leaders are right about everything. But I'm meanwhile creating a, a ledger right. on the other side of my mind of things that don't fit that picture. And so that cognitive dissonance kind of increases and people can deal with it in one of two ways, which is either by rewriting the history and making the facts comport to their idea of themselves or changing their life. And some of the people changed their life and some of them didn't. It's really interesting because you can have people, you can have two thoughts at the same time. You can, you can find value in some of the things maybe that the Sullivanian teachings uh, were giving you, but at the same time, uh, you know, also see that, um, that there's some very dangerous and destructive things going on. And I think sometimes people, when they're in that situation, think that they feel like it, because they've, it's been what they perceive as a life transforming thing. They give all this other crazy stuff happening a pass because yeah. they're like, it is like you said, it's sort of an all or nothing. 
belief system where it's like you have yeah. to, you know, if you, you got to be all. And people and so found strategies for out. dealing with that. Like one of the people I interviewed would, would say he was starting to have real doubts, but then, and he hated participating in certain group events, but they would go to, there were like a couple of nights a week in which their theater, w their theater would put on kind of musical events for kids in the community. And so they had like a, a rock band that he would play in and they would take requests from kids in the group and make up songs and let people perform. So he liked that, but he hated being there when uh, one of the leaders was directing the theater and telling everybody what to do and screaming at people. And so he's described it as being like, we were like people in a prison where they'd found a part of the prison yard where the searchlight doesn't reach. And so you could hang out there with your friends mm -hmm. and have a good time. And so it's kind of weird. So his friendships, he was very close to lots of people in the group and he ended up staying nearly to the end of the group. Um, uh, and so he's making a, a kind of distinction. Like I really like my friends and I really like the life. I just don't really like the leadership. And so that was his kind of way of dealing with it. So if I can avoid contact with leadership as much as possible and hang out with my friends, that's the compromise I'll, I'll reach. Right. So why didn't, so, Talk about a little bit about writing this book. Why did you decide to take on this topic? It seems different from the stuff that you've, that yeah. you've um, covered in the in your book yes. in the past. Um, well, you know, part of it is, uh, you know, I am a journalist, and journalists are kind of generalists. And when mm -hmm. you find a good story, you pursue it. And so I heard yeah. about this group from um, friends who knew people in it. And I thought, wow, how could I have been living on the Upper West Side for decades and know nothing about this group that was basically hidden in plain sight just down the block from me? Yeah. And I thought that's Amazing. really weird and interesting. And it's really weird that people were trying in however a misguided way to create an alternate utopian society, but not in an ashram in India or a commune in northern Vermont, but right Up here in on the New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but right in the Upper West Side of Manhattan and leading normal, you know, going to normal jobs as high performing professionals by day and leading this, you know, slightly wild um, uh, alternate life by night. So that just really intrigued me. And I just started, you know, reporting it. And, you know, sometimes this happens with stories. You report something and after you've done a few weeks of work, you think, okay, I have enough for a story. I'm ready to move on to something else. In this case, the deeper I got into it, the more interesting it became and it just kept growing. And the first few people I interviewed then became a dozen and then became a few dozen and then it became 60 and 70. And there was more I realized I understood about were people the eager to talk. They varied a lot. Some people were not eager at all. And some people were very gracious and, and quite ready to talk because a lot of people who'd been in this group in their 20s and 30s were now people in their 60s and 70s, and I think ready to reflect on their past. Mm -hmm. Other people didn't want anything to do with um, me. And then there were people who initially said no, who then six months or a year later would email me and say, are you still interested in talking about that thing? And I'd say, sure. Yeah. And um, that would be really, really interesting. Uh, those were great interviews. Um, and. Uh, you know, it was just kind of, uh, it was also just amazing the stories they would tell, partly because these people had been in psychoanalysis for years and had been in basically a sex cult. They would tell you anything, and I mean anything. So you say, well, you did yeah. what? And then what? <laughs> and then this happened? Um, what, were, what were some of the crazy, I mean, they're probably in Well, the to give you an like idea, so. like one of the things that was sort of amazing to me, um, there was a person I interviewed, and I interviewed her at least three or four times already. And then we're talking a fifth time and a name comes up in the course of the interview. And she said, oh yeah, Dee Dee Ag, You know, I helped kidnap her son. And I said, what? I didn't want to actually show too much surprise because I didn't want to like stop right. her from talking. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I just said, oh, that's interesting. Can you tell me about that? And so she tells me the story in which this woman who I was very interested in, whose story I was trying to reconstruct, um, had sent a five-year-old child of hers to boarding school. The child had been miserable and left 
the boy, her, her, the child's father, who was a well-known sculptor, uh, had taken the child to live with him where the child preferred to live. He didn't want to go back to boarding school. So the woman and her therapist say, you've got to get that child back and you've got to get him back in boarding school. So she rents a car and she convinces three other people in the group, including my interview subject, to basically stake out the house of this father. And the mother goes to the front door and engages the father. And one of the other group members goes in the back door. He's met the little boy and they get the little boy uh, to come out with him. And they take the little boy into the car. And meanwhile, the father realizes what's going on. He comes out with a baseball bat and smashes in the windshield of the car while they're all there uh, in confusion. And they drive off with the, you know, the cars, the car windows broken and this terrified child in the back seat. And the child is taken so not to be with his child. mother, tra very traumatized child. And the child is then taken back to boarding school, not to be with his mother, but to be where he doesn't want to be at age five at a boarding school where he um, then uh, is forced to live for uh, a good part of his childhood. And his life was really, really damaged. Did you, did you, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, so you've probably talked to some of the children of the A court. lot of the children, you know, yeah. Twin, they're probably in their 20s and their 30s. And do, they, do most of them have terrible things to say about it? Uh, most of them do. Some of them, not as much. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's very, um, you know, um, you know, like the, the kid that was basically duped into going to, way to, to boarding school said at a certain point, I cannot remember a time in which I didn't hate my parents. You know, they did this to me and I didn't want it to happen to me right. and they didn't visit me and um, it really sucked. Um, you know, um, you know, there's another story of one of the people I interviewed, which to me was absolutely heartbreaking, where he sent away to this awful boarding school in Arizona where they beat the kids and were terrible to them. And um, um, often the kids who were from the Southern group had to spend even the time during vacation, they weren't allowed to come home. They had to stay at the school mm -hmm. that was shut down a boarding with um, personnel who happened to work at the school. Um, there was some not very nice couple that, you know, um, worked on maintenance of the, of the school. And the mother made the kids run around a track so they could earn their dinner, even though these people were being paid to, you know, take care of these kids. So oh my God. one of these kids has, his father is not in the group anymore, and the mother is in the group. And so the father has partial custody and he gets to go back to New York and he spends a week with his dad and has a great time. He's a, you know, a little kid of like seven or eight who gets to be with his parent and the father is spending time with them and it's great. And so he knows that the mother is going to send him back to this boarding school that's been shut down. And so the father says, well, why don't you just stay with me? You know, what's the big deal? You're just going back. You know, you're not going to be with her. Uh, you're just going to be at boarding school. Just stay here. So they go out for a walk into Central Park and the father buys the little boy an ice cream and they're walking along and they notice somebody from the group, like, you know, stretching on a jog. And they notice a second person from the group and a third person. And soon they realize they're being followed and they're like, you know, four or five mm -hmm. people that are coming after them. So they race back to the dad's apartment and there's a guy banging on the door and there's a big fuss. And they call the cops and the cops come and they don't know what to make of this whole thing. And the cop asks the little boy, like, who do you want to be with, your mom or your dad? And he says, I want to be with my dad. And, um, but the father knows he doesn't have legal, full legal custody. So he feels like he needs to contact the mother. They get the mother on the phone and the mother says, you can be with your dad, but you will never see me again. You will never see me again in your life. Mm. And the boy turns to the father mm. and says, what should I do? And the father waffles mm. and says, gee, that's a big yeah. responsibility. I don't know that I can take that. Um, maybe you better go with your mom. And of course, the mother then picks the oh, child man. up. She doesn't even take him back to her apartment. She has the plane tickets in her hand, drives him to LaGuardia Airport and puts him on a plane back to Arizona. And 
you know, that's just like a heartbreaking moment so that some of these kids had oh, to yeah. endure. Yeah, it's so selfish. Yeah. yeah. And it's, he never forgave particular... that oh. that particular child just has very bitter, bitter feelings toward his parents. Luckily, he ended up as a, you know, as a as a functioning adult with a pretty good life and a, and a family of his own. So he escaped, but he certainly has no kind feelings for, um, you know, for his parents and for the, the group. It as seems, a whole. This seems almost like a really quintessential. Yeah, this seems like a really quintessential sort of baby boomer, me generation kind of cult where it's like all about my own personal growth yeah. at the expense of all these loved people around yeah. you, whether, you know, you alienate your family, you alienate your children, but it's all about my, my, you know, growth. And, right. And I find spirituality, I find cults in general are very much like this. They sort of <clears throat> are under the guise of being, you know, about, about humanity and, and improving the world and stuff. But really the people involved in cults tend to be very, very self-involved. Yeah. That um, was certainly this, this kid's perception. And, um, yeah. um, you know, I think what it did do was it offered people the very seductive opportunity of a prolonged adolescence. And so, yeah, I think that's a really, good um, you know, it's a little bit like at a certain point, I kind of used the metaphor of the lotus eaters in um, the Odyssey, you know, where, um, you know, Odysseus and his crew end up on this uh, land where um, the lotus eaters are feeding this food to the crew that's just like so delicious and wonderful and they just don't want to leave. They've completely forgotten about home. And so in a prolonged mm. adolescence for a while, that's like wonderful. Um no responsibility other than to yourself and having a great time and sleeping lots of people and worrying about your own growth and development and your career. Um, but then adolescence kind of wears thin, you know, by the time these people got into their thirties, you think, okay, I've slept with all the people in the group. Um, and I'm not really enjoying, I'm not moving forward. The therapy is completely static and um, I'm a little tired of being told what to do. And I'm not allowed mm -hmm. to have children. I'm not allowed to keep dating. They're actually now, since I'm sick of sleeping with everybody, there actually is one person that I really like a whole lot more than all the other people. And I'd like to make a life with that person. that person. And I can't do it. And my yeah. therapist is telling me, no, 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 you can't do that. You're not ready. And so mm. people outgrew it as, you know, by the mid thirties, adolescence living, living as an adolescent becomes kind of tiresome. Uh, and, uh, so that was one of the things yeah. I think broke the group up is that people wanted to, um, lead their own lives, wanted to have families, wanted to, um, uh, pair off with somebody right. they particularly cared for. Meanwhile, look at the destruction they left behind. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's an incredibly interesting book. It's called the Sullivanian sex psychotherapy and the wildlife of an American commune. Um, uh, Thank you so much for joining me.